If you're looking for an advanced way to create your user interfaces, React might be the tool for you. Today I'll go over what it is, why you might want to use it, and how to use it. There are chapter timestamps there and in the description. React is a declarative UI library similar to Facebook's React. Yeah, I stole that opening phrase from the documentation, what of it? Essentially, by using React, you program UI elements from the ground up as opposed to fabricating them in starter GUI beforehand. A typical project includes building a tree of modules, each with their own instructions on how to display its particular component. This information is then passed to the React library, which mounts it on the player GUI and does its best to reconcile what the player sees with what you've described. Why would I go through all the effort of programming all the properties of my interface line by line and learning this complicated framework when I have a perfectly functional graphical editor right here? That's essentially what my opinion of Roact was before I started using it for myself. However, as you work on bigger and more complicated projects, the perks of Roact begin to reveal themselves. The core function of Roact itself is taking a description of what you want and drawing it on the screen. Describing what you want can take a long time, yes, but the rest of the development process can be dramatically simplified thanks to the declarative nature of Ruact. That's the second time I've used that word I don't understand, so let's define that. The concept of declarative programming is centered around describing what the program should do as opposed to how to do it. The how is what Ruact manages. There are other neat perks to Ruact, such as the reusable nature of the individual components, not just their appearance, but their functionality as well. Having your interface based entirely on code as opposed to objects also makes cooperating with other developers through Git and Roho a hundred times better, since the whole team doesn't have to constantly make sure they're using the latest set of UI elements lest everything break. Okay, I've done my best to explain these fairly abstract concepts, but you can only learn so much before applying anything, so let's get into an example. First, we'll create an element with the createElement function of the Roact library, which we've placed into replicated storage. This call creates a screen GUI and sets its name property to interface, since the first argument is the component we want to create, and the second argument is the dictionary of properties, or props. Element is the term used to refer to an individual object created by Roact. We can also add a third parameter in the form of a dictionary or table to assign descendants to the element. Let's add a text label with the text Hello Roact inside of the screen GUI. To give a specific name to a child element, we'll need to set the element's key in the dictionary of children equal to whatever we want its name to be. Finally, we can load our interface into the game through the mount function, passing through the complete element tree and the place we want to mount it. This simple example should give you a good idea of how to describe what you want and display it through Roact. However, describing individual elements in a tree is just the tip of the iceberg, and the true advantages of Roact begin to reveal themselves with components. Components take many forms, but they are best considered as different classes of elements that support custom behavior. The simplest component is a host component, which is simply a standard Roblox class name. We used these in our previous example, where screen GUI and text label were our components. The next type of component is a function component, which has the ability to be defined by the developer. A function component is simply a function that receives a dictionary of props, which can then be used in any manner and then return any objects to add to the tree. This example accepts a list of props and then assigns them to a text label. It's worth noting that, for custom components, it's up to you to embed its children properly. You can access a component's children through the props dictionary using the roact.children key. The most powerful component is the stateful component. They're more advanced, but allow for significantly more functionality, with support for powerful features like state, which we'll discuss later. For now, let's focus on the lifecycle methods by stepping through a simple example. First, we need to create our component by extending the component class included with Roact. Let's call it greening and pass the name as an argument to the extend function for debugging purposes. Next, we'll make the render method, which is the heart of the component. This method uses the props provided in the object's state to provide elements to add to the tree. Let's create a text label using the name prop we'll pass to the component. This component can now be used to create a text label with the provided name. For its extensive functionality and fairly simple implementation, we'll be using stateful components for the rest of this video. It's typical for individual components to be placed into their own module scripts for ease of organization, where each module just returns the component. We've already used props a fair bit, but let's go into more detail. With host components, provided props should only be key value pairs that correspond to existing properties of the Roblox instance being created. However, when we step into developer-defined components, props simply become a way to send arguments to the component. For instance, you can make the type of element created dependent on a prop, as shown in this example. Handling events with Roact is incredibly simple. The event and handler are passed as a key value pair in the props dictionary, just like any normal property. Events should be referenced through the event dictionary included with Roact. In this case, I can detect when the button is clicked with Roact.event.activated. Next, I'll write a function to handle the event. Handlers should expect to receive the actual underlying Roblox instance associated with the event, followed by any parameters typically provided by the event. The activated event provides an input object and a click count, so I'll include those and print the click count. 
Rollact also has its own variation of the getPropertyChangeSignal function to detect changes to specific properties of an instance. Its syntax is essentially identical, except the property name should be used instead of the event name, and it should also be used to index the change dictionary instead of the event dictionary. The handler will only receive the instance that changed. What can we do with event handlers? Well, for one, we can modify the component's appearance with bindings. We mentioned lifecycle methods before, and this is a case where one of those methods will come in handy. The init method runs when the component is first mounted, which makes it the best place to define things like bindings. Let's do that. For this example, we'll create a text button that displays the click count of the last activation, so we'll want a binding to hold the latest click count. We can create a binding with the create binding function, providing a default value. In our case, we just want to set it to zero. The create binding function actually provides two results, the binding itself and a function to update it. It's standard practice to place both of these into the component itself, with the binding being given the normal name and the update function being called update with the name after that. In our render method, we'll create a simple text button element and set its text equal to the click count binding. Now, whenever the click count is updated, the UI element's property will automatically adjust itself to reflect the change. Let's actually update our binding by bringing in our previous event example and calling its update click count function when the button is activated. The update function expects to receive a new value for the binding, and since we want to increment the click count, we'll need to get access to the value, not just the binding itself. We can do that with get value, which returns the raw value without the binding. This means we can add the click count used in the activation to the existing click count binding's value, and then pass this to the update click count function, automatically updating the button's text to reflect the change. But what if we want to add some text to the button besides the number? If we convert the raw value to a string and add it to the phrase, the property won't update with the binding anymore. We need a way to mutate the binding in a way that doesn't disconnect it, and that way is creating a map for the binding. Bindings have a method called map that accepts a transforming function. The function itself receives the binding's latest value and should return the modified value to be applied to the property. Now we can modify our binding before displaying it. State is very similar to bindings with only a couple of differences, the main one being how it re-renders the entire element when it's updated as opposed to just changing any bound props. This comes in handy for situations where your use of a variable proves to be more complex than just put value here. Let's suppose we have a situation where we want to show a completely different element depending on the state. We'll extend a new component and set the default state within the init method using setState, which accepts a dictionary of key value pairs to write. If a value already exists in the state, it'll be overwritten by the value passed here. If no value is passed, it'll retain its previous version. For our purposes, let's just create a flag to track which element should be visible, flipped on by default. Now in the render function, we can check if the element flag value is true. If it is, we'll return a text button that can be clicked. If it isn't, we'll just return a text label with some text telling the user to be patient. Let's detect when the button is clicked and update the state to disable the flag. Then we'll wait 2 seconds and flip it back. This gives us a text button that changes to a text label for 2 seconds when we click on it. Sometimes it's necessary to gain access to an element's underlying Roblox instance, typically when assigning properties to other objects that expect instances as their properties. Refs are ideal for this. They're very similar to bindings, both in terms of syntax and usage. Let's suppose we want to create a surface GUI that appears on a part we add to Workspace. To do this, we'll need to set the surface GUI's Adorni property to the part, which means we need to create a ref pointing to the part in Workspace. We'll start by using the createRef function to define our ref in the init method. The createRef function doesn't accept any arguments. Next, in the render method, we'll create a part in Workspace. To assign it to our ref, we'll pass a prop through to it with the key of ruact.ref and the value of the ref we defined in init. Then we'll add a surface GUI as a child of the part, and as we define its props, we'll set its adorni to the ref. Much like bindings, you'll need to call getValue on the ref to get its actual value outside of use and props, though you should keep in mind it'll return nil until the object is mounted. Thing is, putting our surface GUI inside of the part isn't necessarily the best idea. It would make more sense to put it into player GUI instead, but as you've probably caught on, the tree structure of Roact elements would make that difficult without mounting a completely separate Roact tree. And that's where portals come in. Portals make it possible to parent Roact elements under other objects outside of the tree. A portal acts as its own element, and the only prop it receives is a target, which serves as a new parent for any of the portal's children. Any children added to the portal will appear under the portal's target, so we'll move our surface GUI to be under the portal. In this example, we have a frame with a UI list layout inside of it, and a component that provides labels to be shown in the frame. However, in order for the labels to be affected properly by the layout, they need to be under the same parent. However, we can only return one element through the labels components render method, so how do we work around that? Our best bet is to use fragments. Fragments are useful for creating a component that returns multiple objects without wrapping them in another instance. To make a fragment, simply use the create fragment function, which accepts a dictionary of elements as its only argument. When we return the fragment, you can see that it now renders on the same level as the UI list layout. 
Previously, we talked about passing information down to lower level components through props, but this gets rather tiresome, particularly when it comes to nesting components. To simplify this process, we can use context. Context can be thought of as a more complex version of state that spreads across multiple components. The first step is to create a context object with the createContext function, which accepts a default value as its only parameter. The function returns a new context, which has a provider and a consumer class we can use later. Later, in the component that needs access to the context information, we'll wrap the contents of the render method into a new element, passing the consumer of the context through as the element kind. The only prop a consumer component requires is a render function that receives the context information and returns the rest of the component like normal. In this example, I'm setting the background color and text color of the label equal to the theme settings defined in the default value of my context module. But what if I wanted to change the theme while the game was running, or only for a specific section of the Roax tree? This is where providers come in. Let's create a new component called subtheme. In its render method, we'll make a new element using the provider of our context as the element kind. Providers only expect a single prop, which should be the new context value. We'll also want to pass through the children of the component so they'll actually render. Now, we can surround components we want to affect with the different contexts with our subtheme component. Alright, this part isn't necessarily a feature of Roact, it's more of a method, but it's important to cover because it'll make your life a whole lot easier. Everything we've discussed so far regarding the flow of information between components has revolved around passing info down the tree to subcomponents. However, there will be a lot of times where you'll want to pass information up the tree as well. Think of a close button component that needs to toggle the parent frame's visibility. In this scenario, it's best to create your own updater function in the frame component and pass the function down to the button component as a prop. From the button component, you can hook up the button's activated event to the updater function, which will change the frame's visibility when the button is clicked. Heck, in this example, you don't even need to create your own updater function. You can just create a binding for the frame's visibility property and pass the binding's updater function down instead. This may seem obvious to you, but I only just figured it out, and man, it's going to save me a lot of headache down the line. There's no perfect UI framework. It's all about trade-offs, and despite some limitations that'll be annoying at times, I consider the organization Roact provides to be worth the extra time and effort. I suggest you try it as well and see if it's right for you. Talk to your doctor about Roact today. <laughs> now, Roact is really complex, and I didn't have time to dive deep into every aspect of it. You'll undoubtedly come across problems that even I don't know how to solve. In that case, I'd highly suggest you check out a few sources that helped me out tremendously. The first place to look when you're stuck is obviously the Roact documentation, which is hosted on GitHub. The API reference especially does a great job of showing every tool at your disposal, and I've basically always got it open on a secondary monitor. Thing is, for questions that are more complex and less, you know, what does X do, just reading documentation won't always get you that far. In that case, the Roblox open source community Discord server has a channel specifically for Roact that's full of some really cool people with encyclopedic knowledge of the program who literally made Roact what it is. You can search for your question in there, because chances are, someone's asked it already. Otherwise, you can just ask it yourself. As always, links to everything are down below. This took forever to make. I am going to go die now. Goodbye.